Good morning. How are you? You're doing good? Uh, I want to, it, it struck me this week, I found out this week what the attire of heaven is. Do you want to see it? It's in this bag. I'm just saying. So just stay with me. Um, if I can get it out of the bag here. I'm just saying. Uh, I don't know, they won like 60 something games or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, and you have to have this when you go through the pearly gates, too. Uh, <laughs> L.A., baby. Uh, I know you're not from California. I am, so nothing better than a Dodger dog watching the game in the blue stadium. So praise God he spoke this week. So <laughs> I'm feeling good. It's good to have you in God's house. When I was working on my master's degree in Hebrew at Dallas Seminary back in uh, 81 to 85, uh, when I was... Um, in my fourth year, I had to take, you had to take a number of exegetical classes, and one of them I took was the book of Psalms. And, uh, and so, uh, as you went through the Psalms with the professor, um, I think he was from Oxford, a uh, very uh, skilled professor, he would arbitrarily assign you as students passages to exegete. Uh, and so, uh, the, one of the passages that he gave me, I think I was 24 years old at the time, was Psalm 46. Uh, and, you know, when you're in your 20s, reading things, you're thinking, you know, how, how am I going to actually say anything about this? Because uh, you don't have a lot of history behind you. So I began to study, exegete that, took all my grammatical skills, put them to play in, uh, in analyzing this great text. What is interesting is, uh, that was when I was about 24, now I'm 62. And what I found interesting this week is I was looking at what's the next psalm to study uh, as we look at all of them. Because we're not covering all 150 of them because we'd be here till Jesus returned. Uh, and so it's like Psalm 46 is most appropriate for the week that we're facing. Uh, and what God taught me back then in my 20s uh, is still applicable today, that God's word is timeless. And it's what we need to listen to. So, so what did God say? Well, Psalm 46, he says this, Korah. It's a song for Alamoth. Uh, God is our refuge and our strength. He's a very present uh, help in a time of trouble. What's the conclusion? Therefore, we as Christians will not want Fear. Even, and he gives you these worst case scenarios. Even though the earth be removed, the mountains be carried away into the midst of the sea, though the waters roar and are troubled, though the mountains shake and with, its, with its swelling, then Selah is just the Hebrew code word for that's the end of that little uh, statement. Um, he says, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, speaking of Jerusalem, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, speaking of the city. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. Uh, and he says when he'll do that. He says he's going to do it just at the break of dawn. He says the, rage, uh, the nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He, God, uttered his voice, and the result was the earth, earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come, he says, behold the works of the Lord who has made the desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow, uh, and he cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in fire. What's the result of God being so powerful? Verse 10 says what? Be still and do what? Know that I'm God. He says, I will be, not I might be, I hope to be. God says, I will be what? Exalted among who? The goyim, the nations, the Gentiles. He says, I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. He said this before. He's telling us again because, uh, you know, brain cells die daily. He says, the Lord is ho host is with us because sometimes we forget that. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. So there's three Selahs letting you know when you look at this passage, this pericope, what the divisions are, the flow of thought. Um, what is the historical setting of this particular psalm? That is most crucial to understand its meaning for us today. So Germans would call it the Sitz im Leben, the life setting. Uh, we would be looking for what's the historical life setting of this psalm. Uh, it's easy to see, and I read the text up front instead of exegeting it as we went along to help you understand uh, my next point, the, and this is super important, the, the historical setting of the psalm is the city of Jerusalem is under attack by barbarians. They're massing outside the city gates. They can see them, they can hear them, they can hear their mocking, except their chanting, etc. They know war is imminent, they're about to lose the nation. And they're fearful that things are never going to be the same again. It's over for them as Jews if they don't fight to the death and win. What happened? Well, as you can see from the passage, based upon the commands that are put into the passage, uh, fear replaced faith. Internal chaos replaced calm. Distrust replaced trust of each other. You know, there's uh, all kinds of thoughts, I'm sure, raced through their heads as the barbarians massed outside the gates of the city. 
what will happen to my family? How, long, how will I make a living if they take over the country? Uh, how will we be able to live under the iron fist of a foreign power? Uh, will our worship of God be curtailed or abolished? How will we and what will we eat if the siege lasts a long time? Uh, is the siege brought on by our failure to abide by the absolute laws of God? Um, did our penchant for tolerating all forms of worship move God to discipline us? Because that's one of the reasons that happened. What could our, le what could our leaders have done uh, to keep this possible implosion from occurring that they did not do? And why weren't we more courageous to hold our leadership accountable to keep this from happening to us as a people? And the final question, where is God? Where is God in all this? Now, all of a sudden, the text goes from an ancient text to a present-day text, doesn't it? Because we all understand the nature of barbarians who try to destroy nations. Because we can understand our, our great nation has been under attack for years. Since I was a kid, I can remember all the things that have happened through the 60s, the riots, the you name it. Um, that what was stated in Psalm 46 is applicable, uh, David's day is still applicable to our day because God's people always face, well, the same things they face, the barbarians. Uh, and so the question uh, or the statement that you can derive from this text is a simple one. And this is the main hermeneutical idea of the passage. Because God is who he is and what he says here, what should we understand as we look at our, our, as our culture? What does he say? He says, saints should respond with what? Calm, calm. In to the calamity and the chaos. So no matter which uh, political party you hold, uh, how fearful you might be, you should always look at the, the situation that you face with calm because God's sovereign, isn't he? He's always on his throne. He never steps off the throne. And so when we look at the culture in which we live, we have uh, many forces arrayed outside of our country and inside of our country uh, who seek to overthrow what our country is. So whether it's a foreign force or it's ideological worldviews that are godless inside the country, uh, they're, they're creating great angst. And our response should be uh, calm, calm in the midst of chaos. And he gives you three reasons why you should have calm. Number one, first reason why you should have calm is because your God is the fort. So you should not fear. He's your fort. He's your fortress. Notice what he says. He says, this is a, a song for Korah. Uh, and, 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 the, and the Alamoth should be singing it. Korah, those were the priests of, in Israel that led all the worship services. Alamoth is a Hebrew word which means virgins. Uh, that, that's what that word means. So it means the young women, in the, basically the Gen Zers in their day and time, were responsible to sing this song to the church in worship, which tells you by way of application, the young people, the young ladies at, here contextually, were the ones leading the people to, to calm in the midst of chaos. What's that mean in our day and age? In our day and age, the young people should be looking at what God's word says and saying, I need to abide by what the word of God says, not what my culture says, and lead my nation to peace. It's a great responsibility. He says, it's a song for Alamoth. And then he gets into the first reason why you should not fear. He says, God is our refuge and strength. Let's, let's focus on what he says there. God is our refuge. Uh, the word God here is Elohim. Elohim, the first name of God in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter one, verse one, when it says, in the beginning, God. That's the first time his name is used, Elohim. Be'ereshet is the word in the beginning. Elohim, ha Elohim is his name. He created the heavens and the earth. Um, this, this particular word occurs first in the sentence here to make it totally emphatic. He says, if you wanna know why you shouldn't have, have fear, well, it's because of Elohim. And he says, let me leave, let me leave out the copula, the, the verb. So that with, with no verb in a sentence, read this in a really wooden way and focus on Elohim's great name. Who is he? Well, he's the creator. He's the creator God. Uh, he is the one who, it, who always is, who spoke all things into existence that were not in existence. He's the ontological one that's outside of time and space, who created all cause and effect. He's not in effect, he just is. And because he's who he is at all times, he can give you the two things that are listed here. What does he give you? Two things, refuge and strength. He gives you these two things because of who he is. Imagine the creator of the cosmos says you should not fear national calamity because I am who I am. I am the great creator God. He says, because I am, you can come to me as a refuge, as a fortress. Uh, that particular word refuge is used in Psalm 61 verse four uh, where it's denoted uh, in a parallelistic fashion uh, uh, as a strong military tower. It's like a, a tower on a fortress wall. God says, that's like me. If you're fearful, 
You run to me and you will find that when you come into me in prayer and meditate and run into my presence, that I will always give you what? What does he say? Strength. The very thing that we seem to lack when things seem testy. And it doesn't really matter if you want to make it practical, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, it doesn't matter. Either way, you're, you're fearing what Tuesday might be, right? Wh whichever party you are. And, and you're calling the other party the barbarians, right? And what does God say to you? God says to you, whichever way this goes, you can always run to me and you'll find, find that when you, you, when you get into my presence, I will always give you strength to weather whatever it is that's going to happen. Strength. Emotional strength. I mean, think about Samson. When Samson uh, sinned uh, with uh, Delilah, and God took his great strength with him, and they made a mockery of Samson. But eventually, they made the great mistake of putting Samson in the temple of Dagon. Uh, Dag is the Hebrew word for fish. So they worshiped a, a fish, imagine. And they put him in the temple of Dagon, and they uh, situated him between the two main pillars of the temple. Remember that? Uh, how'd that go for them that day? Well, Samson appealed to God, and in Judges 16, 28, he ran to God as his fortress at a terrible time nationally, uh, and he prayed this prayer. Judges 16, 28. O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this one time, uh, God, that I might uh, take one blow of vengeance on the Philistines for what they've done to my eyesight. They put his eyes out. He said, God, hear, hear your prayer of your, of your great deliverer, your Yeshua, your, your, your savior for Israel at the time. He says, use me, use me in a great way. And God heard him. So he ran to God as his refuge. And God says, I will give you strength for this one episode. You might need to look at your situation and say, I need to run for strength because I'm fearful of Tuesday. And I'm fearful of the rest of the week after that, my, what might happen. And God says, no, uh, if anything, you come to me and I'll give you the strength to, to weather the storm, be what it may. And then he adds this. He says, not only is he refuge and strength, it says he is a very present help in trouble. It doesn't say he might be. It doesn't say he should be. Uh, he uses the adverb to talk about he is very present. Not just present, he's very present. He's present with you in the time of trouble. The word for uh, trouble, sarah, uh, means to be in a, in a restricted place. Uh, I don't know if you've ever gone to an escape room. Have you done one of the escape rooms, especially here in D.C.? If you have claustrophobia, I probably wouldn't suggest it. Uh, but you get in, what's the object? Well, you, you use your uh, ingenuity, uh, cognitive abilities with those with your friends to find the way out of there of the secret room, right? It's an escape room. But when you're in there, you have to feel restricted. And he said, this is like trouble. Trouble is like restrictive. It's like I'm, I'm boxed in. I don't, see, I don't think I have any way out. He says, when you feel like you're in a time of great trouble, realize God's a very present help. You can always count on him. So if you ever run to God as a refuge, and say, God, I, I can't even understand my country, my times, the things that are going on, or what, what's happening. God says, come to me, and you will always find me. I'll always be there for you. When's the last time you ran to him? Or did you run to a talk show host, show, or a TV show, to get built up by a news commentator? No, that'll just make you more nervous and anxious. You know what I'm saying? Run to God, run to God. You will find him. They might educate you, but he will empower you. Do you hear me? They might educate you, but he will empower you. What do you need for the future, regardless of what happens on Tuesday? You need the power from God on high. He says, in, uh, what's the logical conclusion of running to God for power? Verse two gives you the therefore, the conclusion of their argument. Therefore, we as Christians will not want. Fair? Why? Well, he says, let's think about worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. Um, what does he say? Uh, he said, if you took the earth and removed it, no, no need to worry. Why? God's on his throne. He's always a refuge. He'll always empower you. Uh, he says, uh, well, wh what about the mountains? If you took the mountains and, you, and, and California finally slid into the ocean, and I'm from there. They always said that all the time, you know. There's going to be a huge, you know, San Andreas earthquake. It's going to rattle and shake, and then it's just going to break off the whole, from the whole union and just slide into the sea. Some actually probably were praying for that to happen, but... I'm from there, and I've been in, I don't know, I don't even know how many, there was 200 earthquakes where I lived when I was a kid in one week. Just, things were constantly moving. It's unbelievable. Um, so he says, if it were possible to take the greatest mountain ranges in all the world, slide them off into the depths of the ocean, and you watched it, should you, this is not a Hebrew term, but should you freak out? Answer? No, thank you. you should you freak? No, no, why? 
God's on his throne. So t- take all that he says here. I mean, if you took the waters roaring, it's a tsunami. It's a 60-foot tsunami. It's 200 miles an hour. It's slamming against the coast. You're staying at a coastal hotel. You see it coming. Should you freak? Well, yes, you should at that point if you're too close to the water. But all analogies have limitations. What's his point? It doesn't matter how bad it's going to get with the barbarians outside and inside the gates of the city. He says you shouldn't worry because God's sovereign. They're not going to thwart his plan ever. So it really doesn't matter, you know, that which party wins Tuesday. I mean, ultimately, why? Neither will thwart the plan of God. And if you need strength for the day, you run to him, not to all other stated reasons I just listed, whatever your channel might be. Uh, don't do that. Run to God. And you will find him to be the one who will give you strength for the day. Number two, you should not fear. You should uh, have calm because God exists. You don't need to look for the exit. Right? If so-so wins, I'm leaving the country. Oh, okay, where are you going to go? Which country? I've been to a bunch of them. There's a lot of them I wouldn't go to. No, I'm, but I'm, you know, we're selling everything. We're moving to another state. Uh, okay, I've known people that have done that. What does he say? He says, uh, you shouldn't do that. Why? Uh, he says, uh, let's flip from the negative to the positive. He says, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God. That's Jerusalem. Uh, the holy place, the tabernacle, the most high. He says, God is in the midst of her, his city. Uh, as she will not be moved. God will help her, and, and he's going to do it at dawn. Notice what he's telling you here. God's telling you, in, in the city of Jerusalem, uh, and I've been there many times, uh, taking people on tours there, Jerusalem was not built next to a nice, beautiful river. It wasn't. It's built in a rocky, mountainous area where there's not flowing rivers. So where do they get their water? Well, if you come with me to Israel, uh, next time that we go, after they lift the ban and we can get back um, we will take you to israel we'll take you to what is known as the city of david and we will tour uh, hezekiah's uh, water tunnels and we will show you uh, gihon springs that they brought the water up into the city and this is i took this as i was walking so i know it's a little blurry i was underground when i took the picture so don't don't over analyze the pixels okay you're so gracious thank you for encouraging me okay so let's see uh, do you see that little outcropping off the wall there? Do you see that? You have to talk to me. I, thank you. Okay, that little outcropping. They, they, they built that outcropping over the, the, the Gihon Springs to protect it. So in a time of siege, they had water. So in siege, you need two things. Water, food. They could store up the food. If they had food, no water, it's over. If they had water, no food, it's over. So here they had the Gihon Springs. They built this massive wall around it, and then they would pump water into the city from there. And this is the water that fed the Siloam pool where Jesus healed the, the, the man that was blind. And I was there actually, I was actually there when the archaeological team uncovered the pool. I was there when they had the wheelbarrow and found the first steps. I just happened to be walking by. And they had a big fence there with a black curtain on it. And I just kind of did the Christian thing and peeked. <laughs> but the water was there. So what does God say? God is telling you in this. Even in the city that, where I put you, I, I've placed water strategically there so that you can have provision in times of trouble. And because the water's there, you know that I'm there. Because what's the probability in a mountainous region, you would find a water supply, fresh water supply. God said, that's for me. And what's the water do? Well, it, it, it gives you life. It quenches your thirst. I mean, think about it. Water being strategically planted by God for you to drink from. What, what would you say the water would be in our day and time? Because we don't live in near, near a Gihon Springs. Uh, I think it's the, I don't know, the Fairfax Water Company or something is being used of God. But, but this is the spring. What is this? Well, this is my Greek Bible. But this is, the, this, is the, this, is the, this is the word. This is the water. You drink from this, and God says, I'm going to do what? I'm going to quench your thirst. I'm going to quench your thirst. So when your mouth is parched from the advancement of perversion, what should you do? Drink, and God will refresh you. When your mouth is parched because of godless ideologies that are taking over everything and anything, what should you do? Drink of the word. You know, when, the, when people all around you, and you are following anything and everything, and you're in shock, and your mouth is parched from watching that, what should you do? Drink the word. See, when you drink the word, God's gonna, uh, he's gonna satisfy your inner soul. So no matter what you, whatever you're facing, you're gonna know it's gonna be okay. See, years ago, Martin Luther, uh, who was battling his own uh, barbarians in the theological realm, uh, he, 
he read this psalm. He studied this psalm. He meditated on this psalm. It so moved him that the great theologian wrote the song that we all know, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. He wrote that based on Psalm 46, after he fed on this, after he drank from this. A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It's a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he, amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to work our woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Then he says, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear. Remember verse one. For God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we will tremble not for him. His rage can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Martin Luther said, man, I read Psalm 46, and I got all pumped up with hope because God just fed my soul as I drank. You know, uh, you might need to turn to the word of God more often than not. What can barbarians do to you in our culture? They can cancel you. They can defriend you. They can uh, prosecute you over trumped up charges based on laws they created that are not laws. Uh, they can sideline you. They can be all in rage over you. They can yell at you over loudspeakers. They can use all kinds of little signs with catchy statements that don't logically uh, hang together and persecute you with their signage. They can do all kinds of things to create fear. And what, is, what does God say through the pen of Martin Luther? And just one little word. Just one. Don't, don't fear. Don't look for the exit. You don't have to exit. You're God's light where he placed you. And last, uh, don't fear because victory is assured. So you should be assured. Victory is assured, so you should be assured. Come behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow. He cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot. See, he gets rid of all implements of warfare. He is the one who will one day create total peace. You can't vote it in. We look for the Messiah to come to do all the things that are listed here. I'll give you just a taste, and there's more in my notes because they usually overdo things, so I, I can't get into all of them. But Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, talks about this. It's an eschatological day of the future. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all, are, all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That's the uh, Lord of angelic armies. Uh, that, that will leave them neither root nor branch, but you will, who fear my name, the son of righteousness, the Messiah, shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat uh, like uh, stall-fed calves. You, you shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on that day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. He tells you there's coming a day when I deal with the wicked and I elevate the righteous. And that's what we're reading in the, in the Psalms. God says, come behold the works of the Lord. He says, look, look to the past at what he's done, in dealing with barbarians, Moses goes to Pharaoh and says to Pharaoh, my God has a simple request. Let my people go three days out into the wilderness and worship me. Pharaoh says, great idea. What Pharaoh say? I will not. I will not. How'd that go for him? And that's a whole other sermon series, isn't it? God moved the cosmos against Pharaoh and then took his firstborn son to show them that he's God. Um, when the Assyrians uh, surrounded um, Jerusalem under Sennacherib and were about to take it, the king was Hezekiah, a man of prayer. And he went and prayed, oh God, save my nation. What was greater, the forces of Sennacherib who had taken most of the Middle East or the prayer of a king? Prayer of a king, God heard him. God sent one angel through the forces, according to 2 Kings 19, 36. He sent one angel through the forces surrounding Jerusalem uh, of the Assyrians. And in one night, he took out 180, 185,000 Assyrian warriors by just walking through the camp, the death angel. See, God says to Hezekiah, I'll answer that prayer. See, when God says, uh, behold my works, he says, look at the past at what I've done so you don't, you don't freak out in the, in the current. So if God can do great things in the past among nations to accomplish his purposes, then what are we to fear in the present? Nothing. Because God is that great. He can, he can take and destroy the implements of warfare. Isaiah chapter 65 says when God does this, notice what happens when he brings his kingdom. It says the wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like an ox. The dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all of my holy mountains, says the Lord. He says peace is coming. You could stick a, a lamb 
in a pen with a lion, and the lion will not have the lamb for lunch. Total peace. He says, peace is coming. Peace is coming. Do you believe peace is coming? I do. And I know I can't vote it in. Because everybody that we vote in has clay feet, don't they? They all have clay feet. But we look forward to the King of Kings to come. So what is the statement in this passage? It's telling you, be assured because you should be assured because God's assured that he's going to bring the kingdom. So don't fear in the present. Don't make for the exits. Don't, don't, don't be into the chaos. Have calm. Follow me. But he gives a word of, of, of advice here to those who are not Christians. And verse 10 is for non-Christians. Not Christians. He says to non-Christians, be still and know that I am God. He says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted among the earth. He's not talking to Christians, first and foremost. He's talking to non-believers, barbarians. And he's telling them, stop rebelling. Your rebellion will not bring you peace. Stop rebelling. If you are sitting here today, or if you're watching online, uh, and you are one of those uh, who rebels against all things that relate to God and truth, God's looking down from heaven today. He says, you're not going to win, and you're not going to vote in peace. You're not going to vote in a utopia. Uh, you only find peace when you vote by walking toward me in faith. When you get still before me and recognize that I'm God Almighty, I save your soul. Then you have peace. Is that you? If that's you, then I pray that God would, would guide you to his throne where he lovingly waits to give you peace that you can't get from a political system. And I close with his words here. He says, I will be exalted. Doesn't he? He says, I will be exalted. In the lives of the nations, the goyim, the Gentiles, and in the lives of his people, he will be exalted one day. We will live to see him exalted. That is the hope of a saint. So no matter what this week uh, brings to us, meditate, feed on, drink the water of Psalm 46. It will feed the soul. Let's pray. God, we thank you just for the opportunity to read from David's ancient pen and to find great strength and hope for the day in which we live. And uh, some, I'm sure, can't even read this passage without getting emotional about it and not wanting to listen. But may we learn to submit ourselves to your leadership, to following you, because that's the right thing to do, because then we find that shalom, that peace that we so desperately need, and we find strength for living. In Jesus' name, amen.